Okay, you're all set. Okay, so we'll open this meeting at 6.34. According to this clock, it's a little faster than that clock. Join me in a pledge of allegiance. <laughs> I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. The Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> <clears throat> well, as far as our agenda is concerned tonight, it looks like we're limited to approving the minutes and uh, and to continue on with our reading. We don't have anybody in the audience. We would note that for the minutes. Well, Angela, I don't suppose I have to read all these conditions if nobody's here. Okay, so I do need to take roll call though. Okay, do a roll call. Commissioner Melcher? Here. Commissioner Wilkes? Here. Commissioner Parker? Okay. Commissioner Stevens? Craig is here. Okay. Commissioner Journey? Present. And Commissioner Loman, he did call me and tell me he wouldn't be here. Has Angela got her mic on? Yes, I do. Can you not hear me? I can hear you now. Okay. Okay. We need to address the minutes from our last meeting, which was October 21st, 2021. Are there any corrections that any of you have observed or would like to talk about? Um. I'd like to move that we approve the minutes. Okay, we have motion to approve the minutes as they are read by Eva Journey. Do I have a second? I wasn't here. I have to abstain. Okay. How about Greg or Eva? Would you second that motion? Or were you made it, Eva? Yeah. <laughs> I think Greg? you have to second it, Henry, because only you and I were here. Okay, then I will second it. All in favor say aye. Aye. Aye, aye. Okay, <laughs> minutes approved. With that said and done, it's easy for me tonight. Let's proceed with our reading. All right. We left off on uh, the second tab six. 17.8 wireless telecommunications facilities. Sorry, Henry, I gave you the wrong tab. Oh, did you? What did you tell me? Oh. Can you give us a page number? This is page okay. 3-93. 3-93. Okay, I'm close. It's the second tab. Okay, we got it. All right. Let me go ahead and How do you start the This version has no header and footer in it. Sorry about the delay, folks. Let me get to the.
think. Yeah, if I can remember. Um, just to, before we get started on this one, just to note, this one was pretty much lifted entirely from our current development code and no changes were made. So um, it's Is it good. relatively new? Uh, I don't, I, I mean, relatively new, sort of, in that it's probably a little more than 10 years old. Oh. Um, so it's still probably a good idea to review it, uh, okay. but it's, uh, it is newer than the rest of the development code. So is it reading it right now? Because I can't hear it. Oh, you can't hear it? No. Huh. I can see Mr. the cursor going across the words. Yeah. Commissioner Journey, do you hear it? Commissioner Journey? Her mic is muted. Yeah. I've never been able to hear it. I've always just followed the cursor. Oh, really? Oh. Huh. I heard it. Last time. That's That'd strange. I uh, wonder. Everything's turned on though. Yeah. Over there. Mm -hmm. there. Well, why don't I? Thank you. Um, could be something in Teams, I suppose. Let me take a look real quick and see what I find. Which, which, oh. I have an idea. <coughs> oh, I went to here. If they're not able to hear it, but they can see it, maybe you can just scroll your pen or pencil across it as it's being read. Well, really, it's well, been fine to just follow the cursor. That has not been a problem for me. Yeah, so what I'm going to do, though, is I think I'll turn on, have one of these desk microphones just pointed straight up at the speaker. And you can get it that way. Yeah, because I'm, I'm definitely hearing it over the speakers. Um, well, we won't use yours. We'll use one of the others. Well, I didn't put batteries in. Yeah, I'm just going to steal this one. Stick it Stay directly up here. Yeah. Let's see if you can hear it this way. Okay. You hear it now? No, it's just the cursor. No, I could not hear it. Really? There's something in Teams that you have to press. Oh, um, really? Okay. So goes back to the sharing thing. So it includes computer sound? Is that? No, oh. go back. Okay. <sighs> Let's see right at the top right, top right where it says include computer oh. sound. Okay. You're probably right. Let's try that. D to avoid potential damage to property caused by facilities. Yeah, I can hear it. Ensuring okay. such structures okay. are sound and carefully designed, constructed, modified, maintained, and removed when no longer used or are determined to be structurally unsound. 
e to ensure that towers are compatible with surrounding land uses. 17.80.02 Definitions For the purpose of this development code, the following definitions shall apply unless the context clearly indicates or requires a different meaning. Antenna, wireless telecommunications, the physical device, commonly in the form of a metal rod, wire panel, or dish, through which electromagnetic, wireless telecommunications signals authorized by the Federal Communications Commission are transmitted or received. Antennas used by amateur radio operators, police, fire, and AM radio are excluded from this definition. Attached Wireless Communication Facility, a wireless telecommunications facility that is affixed to an existing structure, other than a wireless telecommunications tower. Colocation, a wireless telecommunications facility comprised of a single telecommunications tower or building supporting one or more antennas, dishes, or similar devices owned or used by more than one provider. Lattice tower, a support structure constructed of vertical metal struts and cross braces forming a triangular or square structure which often tapers from the foundation to the top. Monopole, a support structure constructed of a single, self-supporting hollow metal tube securely anchored to a foundation. Provider, a company holding a Federal Communications Commission FCC, license that is in business to provide telecommunications services. Wireless telecommunications, the transmission, via radio frequency electromagnetic waves, between or among points specified by the user, of information of the user's choosing, without change in the form or content of the information as sent and received. Wireless telecommunications accessory structure slash equipment, equipment shelters or radio equipment necessary for the operation of wireless telecommunications in addition to the antenna and tower. Wireless telecommunications equipment shelter, the structure in which the electronic radio equipment and relay equipment for a wireless telecommunications facility is housed. Wireless Telecommunication Facility, WTF, a facility consisting of the equipment and structures involved in receiving and or transmitting telecommunications or radio signals. Wireless Telecommunication Support Facility, a wireless telecommunication tower. Wireless Telecommunications Tower, a structure intended to support equipment used to transmit and slash or receive telecommunications signals including monopoles, guide and lattice towers, but not excluding any other approved structure. Visual compatibility characteristics, characteristics that minimize the visual impact of a tower or antennas. 17.80.030 Review Procedures A wireless telecommunications facilities, hereby referred to as WTFS and slash or facilities within this section, require a conditional use permit. B. The process of review is dependent on the type of facility proposed, i.e. co-located slash attached or freestanding, and its proposed location. 1. Notice. When mailed notice of a public hearing or an administrative action relating to a wireless communication facility is required by this chapter, the notice shall be sent to owners of record of property where the property is located as follows. A. Within 300 feet from the exterior boundary of the subject property when the proposed WTF meets the height requirement of this chapter, and B. For WTFs that exceed the height requirement of this chapter, an additional 50 feet of notice area is required for every 10-foot increment in height. 2. Action by the Planning Commission. Applications to cite a WTF through means other than attachment shall be processed as a conditional use subject to the Type 3 process in Chapter 17.4x. 3. Uses prohibited. Wireless telecommunications facilities shall be prohibited in the Natural Resources Overlay Zone. 17.80.040 Citing Preferences. WTFs shall be cited in accordance with the following priorities in order of their preference. If the applicant proposes a facility on lower priority preferences, the applicant shall prove conclusively that each of the higher priorities has been considered and found to be not feasible. A priority number one. 
Use of an attached wireless communication facility whereby transmission and reception devices are placed on existing structures which are consistent in height with and situated similarly to types normally found in the surrounding area, such as telephone, electrical or light poles. B. Priority number 2. Co-location by placement of antennas or other transmission and reception devices on an existing tower, building, or other structure, such as a utility pole, water tank, or similar existing structure. C. Priority number 3. Siding of a new tower, in a visually subordinate manner, using visual compatibility techniques. D. Priority number 4. Siding of a new tower in a visually dominant location, but employing visual compatibility techniques. E. Priority number 5. Siding of a tower in a visually dominant location, not employing visual compatibility techniques. 17.80.050 Standards and Requirements A general, conflict. All facilities shall meet all requirements established by the other provisions of SHMC that are not in conflict with the requirements contained in this chapter. B. General, compliance. All facilities shall comply with all federal, state and city codes, including, but not limited to, Federal Communication Commission and Federal Aviation Administration standards. C. Access. Access shall meet the standards of the underlying zone. D. Height. One height of a facility shall be measured from the natural, undisturbed ground surface below the center of the base of the proposed facility to the top of the facility or if higher, the tip of the highest antenna or other transmission or reception device. To no WTF shall exceed the height standard of this chapter, except where attached to an existing structure that exceeds that height and the attached antennas do not increase the total height of that structure by more than 10 feet. Ecolocation. One new facilities, if technically feasible, will be designed and constructed for three antennas slash providers to co-locate on the facility and to allow antennas mounted at varying heights. Two, the owner of a facility may not deny a wireless telecommunications provider the ability to co-locate on its wireless communication facility at a fair market rate or at another cost agreed to by the affected parties. Three, a facility may be attached to any existing structure as long as the height of that structure is not increased by more than 10 feet and so long as it meets all relevant requirements of this section. Four, co-location shall not be precluded simply because a reasonable fee or shared use is charged or because reasonable costs necessary to adopt the existing or proposed uses to a shared tower. The Planning Commission may consider expert testimony to determine whether the fees and costs are reasonable. Five, co-location costs that exceed new tower development costs are considered to be unreasonable. F. Construction. All facilities must meet the requirements of the Uniform Building Code and slash or the Oregon Structural Specialty Code. G. Design. Where possible new facilities will be located in such a manner that they blend in with the background around them, using techniques to ensure visual compatibility characteristics. 1. All new WTF towers shall be a monopole or lattice tower structure constructed out of metal or other non-flammable material. 2. All accessory structures, I.E. vaults, equipment rooms, utilities and equipment enclosures, shall be concealed, camouflaged, shall be consistent with the underlying zone or shall be placed underground. 3. Visible exterior surfaces of accessory facilities, i.e. vaults, equipment rooms, utilities and equipment enclosures, shall be constructed out of non-reflective materials. 4 WTFs shall be initially painted and thereafter repainted as necessary with a flat paint. The color shall be one that will minimize the facility's visibility to the maximum extent feasible. H. Landscaping. All WTFs shall be installed in such a manner as to maintain and enhance existing vegetation. Where no vegetation exists, a landscaping plan must be submitted for the site. I. Lighting. No lighting shall be permitted on a WTF except as required for security and as required by the Federal Aviation Administration. Security lighting shall be located in such a manner so as not to face directly, shine or reflect glare onto any street or a lot in a residential zone. J. Location 
No telecommunications facility shall be installed on an exposed ridge line unless it blends with the surrounding existing natural and human-made environment in such a manner as to be visually compatible with the environment. K Setbacks Facilities shall be set back at least 25% of the tower height from all property lines or shall meet the setbacks of the underlying zone, whichever is greater. L Safety all WTFs shall maintain in place a security program that will deter unauthorized access and vandalism. M. Underground Equipment Shelters Underground equipment shelters should be considered. N. Signs 1. Signs shall comply with the requirements set forth in this chapter. 2. All telecommunications facilities shall be clearly identified as to the location and operator so as to facilitate emergency response. 17.80.060 Attached Telecommunications Facilities All attached facilities shall be located and designed to appear an integral part of the structure. A roof-mounted antennas and all building-mounted accessory equipment shall be located no closer to the nearest edge of the roof than the height of the antenna or accessory equipment, whichever is greater. B-wall-mounted antennas shall be architecturally integrated into the building. C wall mounted antennas shall be located no more than 4 feet from the wall face. D accessory structures for attached facilities, such as equipment shelters, cabinets, or other enclosed structures containing electronic equipment, shall be camouflaged or otherwise constructed using visual compatibility techniques. 17.80.070 Abandonment of Facilities Wireless telecommunications facilities that do not have functioning antennas for a period of six months shall be considered abandoned and shall be removed by the owner or operator within 60 days thereafter. 17.80.080 Application A. Application Requirements 1. One copy of the narrative on 8 and 1 half inch by 11 inch sheets. 2. A development site plan drawn to scale with sheet size not to exceeding 24 inches by 36 inches. Where necessary, an overall plan with additional detail sheets may be submitted. 3. All information necessary to evaluate the request. 4. One set of the plan shall be reduced to fit on 8 and 1 half inch by 11 inch sheets of paper. Names and numbers must be legible on this sheet size, and... 5. After the application is accepted as complete, any revisions may require a new application, additional filing fees and rescheduling of the public hearing. B. Development plan required. All applications shall be accompanied by a development plan drawn to scale showing the following. 1. Use or uses. 2. Location of the proposed facility and relevant dimensions. 3. Height of the proposed facility. 4. Setbacks for the proposed facility. 5. A photo simulation of the proposed WTF for the maximum number of providers. 6. Dimensions and location of areas to be reserved for vehicular and pedestrian access and circulation. 7. A landscaping plan that indicates how the facility will be screened from adjoining uses. 8. A fencing plan that indicates the location, height, and design of any proposed fencing. 9. A lighting plan that indicates the type and location of any proposed lighting. 10. A sign plan that indicates the size, location, and design of any proposed signage. 11. Drawings demonstrating the materials, color, and design of the proposed facility. 12. A map showing all existing wireless communication facility sites operated by the provider within 2 miles of the sweet home boundary, or the top of the nearby ridges, whichever is greater, including a description of the facility at each location. 13. A propagation study indicting proposed facility and the adjacent hand-off sites. 14. If provider proposes to construct a new facility, tower, all applications shall include findings that demonstrate that it is not legally or technically feasible to co-locate. A documentation of the efforts that have been made to co-locate on existing or previously approved towers. B. Each provider shall make a good faith effort to contact the owner, S, of all existing or approved towers and shall provide a list of all owners contacted in the area, including the date, form of contact and the result of contact, and 
See documentation as to why co-locating on an existing or proposed tower or attachment to existing structures within one half mile of the proposed site is not feasible. 15. Such other pertinent information shall be included as may be considered necessary by the review authority to make a determination that the contemplated arrangement or use makes it necessary and desirable to apply regulations and requirements differing from those ordinarily applicable under this chapter and the subdivision provisions. See narrative required. A written statement shall include the following information. 1. The name and contact information for the provider. 2. A description of the character of the proposed facility. 3. Analysis of how the application meets the review criteria. 4. Applicants slash providers shall provide evidence of legal access to the proposed wireless telecommunications facility. 5. The applicant slash provider shall provide evidence that legal access to the facility site will be maintained for the duration of the facility's operation. 6. Where a proposed wireless telecommunications facility is located on a property not owned by the provider, the applicant slash provider shall present documentation that the owner of the property has granted an easement or entered into a lease for the proposed facility and that vehicular access is provided to the facility. 7. The applicant shall provide evidence that describes the facility tower's structural capacity to carry the antennas of at least three wireless telecommunications providers. 8. The applicant shall provide evidence of steps the provider will take to avoid interference with normal radio and television reception in the surrounding area and with any public safety agency or organization, per FCC requirements. 9. The applicant shall demonstrate that the WTF is intended to provide service primarily within the community. The city reserves the right to deny a permit if it is shown that the facility is not intended to provide service primarily within the community. 10. The applicant slash provider shall demonstrate that the wireless telecommunications facility must be located where it is proposed in order to service the provider's service area. There shall be an explanation of why a facility at this proposed site is technically necessary. 11. If the applicant slash provider proposes a new tower or co-located facility, the applicant shall provide evidence that the facility's height is the lowest height at which the gap in coverage can be filled. 12. All applications shall include evidence that at least one provider will use the proposed facility and provide wireless telecommunications service immediately upon completion of the facility. The city reserves the right to deny applications that propose a facility without a provider. 13. The application shall include a written agreement that wireless telecommunications facilities owned by the provider, that do not have an operating antenna for a period of six months, shall be considered abandoned and shall be removed by the operator within 60 days. 14. The application shall include a written agreement from the property owner that if the provider fails to remove an abandoned WTF, the property owner has full legal and fiscal responsibility for the WTF removal. 17.80.090 Special Review Criteria A Residential Zones A wireless telecommunications facility is not allowed in any residential zone unless it is an attached WTF that meets the requirements of this section. 1. Access Standards for access are the set by the underlying zone. 2. Height a facility that is attached to an existing structure may not exceed the height of the existing structure, unless findings are made by the Planning Commission that such an increase will have a minimal impact on the appearance of the structure. 3. Landscaping Existing trees and other screening vegetation in the vicinity and along the access road shall be protected from damage, both during the construction period and thereafter. 4. Signs Facilities shall be identified with an identification sign not exceeding 2 square feet in size. 5. Accessory facilities. Accessory structures for attached facilities, such as equipment shelters, cabinets, or other enclosed structures containing electronic equipment, shall be camouflaged or otherwise constructed using visual compatibility techniques. B. Commercial zones. A wireless telecommunications facility in any commercial zone must be either an attached WTF or a monopole, and that meets the requirements of this section. 1. Access Standards for access are the set by the underlying zone. 2. Height The height of a WTF shall not exceed 80 feet. 3. Landscaping 
Existing trees and other screening vegetation in the vicinity and along the access road shall be protected from damage, both during the construction period and thereafter. The accessory structure shall be screened by an evergreen material with an ultimate height of at least 8 feet and a planted height of at least 3 feet. The landscaping must be protected and maintained. 4 Signs Facilities shall be identified with an identification sign not exceeding 2 square feet in size. 5 Accessory Facilities Accessory structures for attached facilities, such as equipment shelters, cabinets, or other enclosed structures containing electronic equipment, shall be camouflaged or otherwise constructed using visual compatibility techniques. See Industrial Zones 1. Access Standards for access are the set by the underlying zone. 2. Height Facilities shall not exceed 100 feet. 3. Landscaping Existing trees and other screening vegetation in the vicinity and along the access road shall be protected from damage, both during the construction period and thereafter. The accessory structure shall be screened by an evergreen material with an ultimate height of at least 8 feet and a planted height of at least 3 feet. The landscaping must be protected and maintained. 4. Signs Facilities shall be identified with an identification sign not exceeding 2 square feet in size. 5. Accessory facilities Accessory structures for facilities, such as equipment shelters, cabinets, or other enclosed structures containing electronic equipment, shall be camouflaged or otherwise constructed using visual compatibility techniques. All right. You all still with us? Yep. <laughs> do, we, do we have any way of <clears throat> following up when, once we've approved something? You mean well, uh, what I'm alluding to is that when we've had polls in the past, uh, we've got one up at the Elks Lodge, one down at Leicester Shingle Mill, mm -hmm. uh, Lumber Yard, is that we've sometimes had some pretty fierce opposition and fear that it would interfere with their television and their radios and so forth. And yeah, once it's done, we, we never hear much more about it. Have we had follow-up complaints? Uh, are so, there things that we need to follow up on or not? So we, we do receive, I mean, the city in general receives complaints on a variety of things, and people certainly let us know if they're not happy with a decision that's been made and if there's been some sort of result that's not uh, compatible with their life. When it comes to the wireless tel telecommunications facilities, when I uh, soon after I first started, uh, about two years ago, we approved two. Um, the one for Verizon at, that you mentioned at Lester uh, Shingle Mill, um, and that one, they just barely, not long ago, started construction. It took them a long time to actually get going. The other was at the Elks Lodge, and that one we had more opposition to. But since it actually got constructed, we received no complaints. In fact, uh, one of the things I was going to bring up, the, the builder of that facility asked that it be modified to not be required to paint it and the reason he gave was that the material it was made out of itself one didn't require paint for maintenance and two was already very dull in color and and blended in quite nicely the way it was and he was worried that by painting it it would bring it bring more attention to it um he asked us about that we said well get some get some feedback from the neighbors uh, on what the, if they're happy with it the way it is so that we can make sure we have some documentation to support that request and he did and, and many of the neighbors complied and basically said yeah it's fine we don't we don't need anything it doesn't we don't see it it, it, it blends in quite nicely and so um, my thought is that if there was a problem we certainly would be hearing about it um, and with those particular um, uh, applications we just haven't had any problem good news so that being said um i noticed some some typos and we'll address those okay. but a couple things i wanted to bring up with you one in particular was that painting requirement mm -hmm. 
whether uh, you were okay with adding some language. Right now it says the color shall be one, or WTF shall be initially painted and thereafter repainted as necessary with a flat paint. The color shall be one that will minimize the facility's visibility to the maximum extent feasible. I wonder if we can add a sentence that uh, can essentially say, unless the material that it's constructed out of is naturally dull and non-reflective uh, in a in a you know a color that doesn't stick out. I don't know the exact words that we would use, but something to that effect is that suitable to you? Yes. I I just don't want to cause any more trouble for an applicant than is right. necessary. And um, you know, there's there's a lot of those you know, especially some galvanized steel type things where some of them are just so dull and a natural gray that blends in no matter what. Well, you think that also as time goes by that the uh, materials used for that kind of a facility would improve to the point probably where paint wouldn't be required at all. Mm -hmm. So, and then just as long as we're on this subject, I don't know where this language came from originally 10 years ago, mm -hmm. but I'm assuming that there's some boilerplate um, language that we could just double check and make sure that this 10 year old language is still current by today's standards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We can we can check on that. In the industrial zone 17.22.040 Oh, for conditional uses, it does not include wireless telecommunications as a conditional permitted use. And do we want it to ha require a public review for an, in an industrial zone? I'm just looking at the other permitted uses. So, Jamie, what... Um what page are you on? Um, it's chapter 17.22010, industrial zone, under conditional uses, it is not listed as a, a use in that zone. And do we want it to be a conditional use permit in an industrial zone or could it be a staff level review? industrial that's kind of a probably a pretty typical use for an industrial zone mm -hmm. be pretty minimal impacting is that zoned industrial no okay yeah one of the outright permitted uses is commercial radio stations and antennas so okay. that's an outright permitted use in the in the industrial zone. Yeah. And so we could expand that to say commercial radio stations, antennas, and wireless telecommunications facilities because they're, those permitted. are essentially the same thing. Right. And that would tie this zone it into would. this provision. Because back here it says it's conditionally permitted. Yeah, and that's and so that's 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 interesting because if if an outright permitted use is a commercial radio station, then what's the difference between right. that and a wireless telecommunications yeah, facility? Yeah, because it's not listed under the conditional uses in the industrial zone. Right. But it is back there. Right. So, um, so where does it say it's conditionally? Um, on review procedures require a conditional use permit mm -hmm. on 17.80030. So I guess uh, under action by, you mean action by planning commission? It's actually also under A, review procedures A. Yeah, true. Right, that it requires a conditional so use permit. So should we add 
language that basically said unless it's in unless located in an industrial zone. Mm -hmm. Is that the rest of you agree with that? Yeah, I yeah. think tying these two together is a good idea. Good catch, Jamie. You're welcome, Eva. <laughs> Um, one other thing that I noticed, it has a definition for visual compatibility characteristics, but then it never uses the term visual compatibility characteristics. It uses the term visual compatibility techniques. Um, and so I just wonder if we should just change that definition to techniques instead of characteristics. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and change the definition to so that that, that would make sense. But Essentially, it would be visual compatible compatibility techniques, and then it would be um, the you know the practice of of employing characteristics that minimize the visual impact of a tower or antenna, something mm -hmm. like that. In Arizona, they all look like palm trees. Nobody's <clears throat> fooling. Nobody's fooled with that. Well, I was. <laughs> Were no, you? No. <laughs> I remember seeing but one. It was kind of neat to see. Yeah, I remember seeing one in uh, in Utah that was um, made to look like a pine tree. Mm -hmm. um, it it did not actually look like a pine tree, and <laughs> it was it very like, different it than like the surrounding pine art. trees. Abstract art. Right. Yeah. Well, then the motif for us should be a duck fur, right? Yes, sure. Sure. Absolutely. Why not? But. Uh, <laughs> I think that it would probably look more out of place as a Doug fur than it would be if you just <laughs> had a dull matte gray color. This is an interesting section. I've been in Honduras and I have been in Bolivia where the hillsides on the sides of the big cities mm -hmm. are literally saturated with hundreds and hundreds of cell towers. Oh, wow. I mean, it's, it's quite a sight to see it. Is that uh, just because they have, they don't share or are they? I have no idea. I just remember being there and uh, riding on a bus and looking at that hillside and thinking there's hundreds and hundreds of towers. <laughs> yeah, they can be unsightly. One other thing that, came to my mind and I'm not seeing it exactly, but <clears throat> on the height that said that we're not to exceed the height of the building on which it is attached. Residential zones. And unless I, unless it's unless a, I think it gives you an allowance of ten feet or so for the And then, then we have actual another equipment. section that said ten feet. Are are they consistent? I, I just remembered the ten yeah. foot and then the For example, 17.80.0902. Yeah. We don't exceed the height of the structure. And some places said structure plus 10 feet. Mm hmm. Yeah, the. Where was, it's interesting to have that the height requirements in multiple spots. Um, oh, under co location, it says. A facility may be attached to any existing structure as long as the height of that structure is not increased by more than 10 feet and so long as it meets all relevant requirements of this section. Um, so it is a little confusing to have multiple rules on, on height. Um, you can just note it if you want. Yeah, I'm not sure how to, it, it, we want it to be easy to use. And frankly, from our experience two years ago, this isn't the easiest process to, um, to go through. So whatever can be done uh, to make it easier, that would be great. But I 
I guess what I guess what you could do is under D height, you could have it say height and then comma and then say except as except as the um what's the word? Right. What I was saying is that though that if you have it specify under uh, under 17.80.050 D height, if you add a sentence right after height that says um, um, unless otherwise directed by the special review criteria in 17.80.090, one the height of a facility shall be measured, and two no WTF shall exceed the height standard. So essentially, it adds a, a reference that would direct people to the special review criteria and should make it a little bit easier to use. Well, I don't want to cause any problems. No, but we want to reduce problems and having it be more clear is definitely our goal because the staff members you have now are not always going to be the ones that are doing this. and. You have to assume that someday you're going to have a, a a planner that's never done one before uh, under our rules, and so it's good to make it as clear as possible. Well, height of the roof plus ten feet sounds personally, you know, really reasonable to me. Any other thoughts on this uh, chapter? You say it once, spelled out, and then everything else should be the acronym. Well, then it has that, well, and then there's the one where it says everything hereafter is WTFS, but it's not. But then it's not. Yeah, the S needs to go away. So, so if anything referred to here with this section, it doesn't really need to spell it out anymore because it already says that. Mm -hmm. That's just my two cents. Why would definitions be specific to this chapter and not in the front under definitions? Um, I think mainly because th this was done on its own at some point. So I guess that that is a good question. Should that all be integrated? Um, I believe I talked with Walt about that when we were looking at this and um, the the thought was with this and with like the flood zone ordinance, um, because they're so specialized, the idea okay. was to kind of keep them separate and note that they, in the definitions um, for the whole thing, note that they're handled separately. Uh, so what about under definitions if we put um, like wireless telecommunication See definitions in chapter 17.80. So if someone's just picking up our code and looking at definitions. Yeah. Or maybe we do have something in there. I didn't even look. You know, um, they actually. We do. They are in here. Are they? Yep. Yeah, they are. Yep. Not all of them, though, because antenna. Is not there. Unless it was under wireless to me. Yeah. Yeah. 
equipment facility. Yeah, because if there are, if there are all in the. Uh, I don't see antenna, but there's a whole bunch of other wireless mm -hmm. telecommunications ones. Equipment shelter facilities. I, I just hate to be redundant if we don't need to be. Yeah, I was wondering why there were definitions in this chapter as well. These first ones, antenna attached, co-location, those ones probably need to be added. All the ones that say wireless telecommunications seem to be there. Yeah, they're not, uh, they, there seem to be some of them that are in the other section for definitions, but not all, and that's, I don't know why. So um, we can just get rid of this definition section and make sure that all the definitions are in the main set of definitions. Um, I think that's reasonable. Yeah, I agree. That would be more consistent. Works for me. Okay, we can do that. Any other thoughts on this section? If not, we will move ahead. I think it looks pretty good. To... 17.82, which is the last of this article. 17.82 general standards. 17.82.010, lots of record. A, a parcel is a legal lot of record for purposes of this development code when the lot conforms to all zoning requirements, subdivision requirements, and comprehensive plan provisions, if any in effect on the date when a recorded separate deed or contract creating the separate lot or parcel was signed by the parties to the deed or contract. B. Lots in recorded plats may be combined under a single ownership for the purpose of developing the combined property, subject to approval of a property line adjustment. C. The use or development of any legal lot of record shall be subject to the regulations applied to the property when such development or use is commenced, IR respective of the lot width, street frontage, depth, or area, but subject to all other regulations. 17.82.020 Exceptions to Lot Size Requirements This section shall apply in the event that a lot or the aggregate of contiguous lots held in a single ownership as recorded in the office of the recorder of the county and located in the city as of January 1, 1971, or the date of annexation of the property to the city, whichever is later, has an area or dimension which does not meet the lot size requirements of the zone in which the property is located. In this case, the holdings may be by a use permitted in the zone subject to the other requirements of the zone. If there is an area deficiency, residential use shall be limited to a single family dwelling, or to the number of dwelling units consistent with the lot area per dwelling unit requirement of the zone. 17.82.030 Lots abutting a partial street. New structures which are proposed to be constructed on lots abutting an existing public street which does not meet the minimum standards of section 17.42 for right of way width shall provide setbacks sufficient to allow for the future widening of the right of way. Building permits shall not be issued unless a yard setback equal to the minimum yard requirements of the zoning district plus the required minimum additional right of way width is provided. 17.82.040 Protection of runoff capacity of natural drainage channels. A property owner shall not allow the water carrying capacity of any drainage way within his property to deteriorate and subsequently contribute to flood hazard. The property owner shall remove excess debris from the channel including dead vegetation. Neither shall any fill or garbage by dumped in any drainage way. Failure to maintain the water carrying capacity of the drainage way shall empower the city to enter the property and take whatever action is necessary to ensure that the carrying capacity of the drainage way is not impaired and then assess the real property and improvements for the cost of the city's actions. Grading permits may be required and are subject to provisions in Chapter 17.46. 17.82.050 Farm Uses and Livestock If permitted in the zone, allowed as an accessory use, or otherwise permitted as a commercial or industrial activity, the following limitations shall apply. Acres, orchards, and gardens. 
the growing of crops, orchard products, vegetables, or similar food items for personal use shall be permitted. B. Livestock, chickens, rabbits, and similar. The breeding, raising, boarding, or selling of horses, cows, bulls, mules, sheep, goats, alpacas, llama, emus, bees, or other similar farm animals are subject to provisions in Title VI of the Sweet Home Municipal Code. 17.82.060 General Exception to Building Height Limitations Projections such as chimneys, spires, domes, elevator shaft housing, towers, aerials, flagpoles, and other similar objects not used for human occupancy may be constructed to a height not to exceed 1.25 times the height limit for the zone. 17.82.070 Height Exceptions for Public Buildings Public or quasi-public buildings, religious buildings, hospitals, and educational institutions when permitted in a zone may be constructed to a height not to exceed 1.75 times the height limit for the zone, provided all the required yards are increased one foot for each two feet of additional building height above the height regulation for the zone. 17.82.080 Additions to Existing Structures when structures exist at the time a zone is adopted which do not comply with an individual yard setback restriction, additions to such structures not conforming to the yard setbacks shall be allowed, provided a. the setback distance will not be decreased by the addition, b. the addition conforms to all other provisions of the zoning district, c. the addition shall not be greater than 40, 40 percent of the square footage on the ground level of the existing structure. 17.82.090 Miscellaneous Exceptions to Setback Requirements Setback limitations stipulated elsewhere in this development code may be modified as follows. A. Bus shelters. Bus shelters which are intended for use by the general public and are under the ownership and slash or control of a city, county, state, or municipal corporation shall be exempt from setback requirements provided they do not violate clear vision provisions in section 17.56. B. Underground structures. Side and rear yards of underground structures may be reduced to 3 feet except 1. Where the perimeter wall of the structure is above the natural elevation of the adjacent ground, in which case the setback provisions of the district shall apply. Do all openings into the structure, including doors, windows, skylights, plumbing, intake, and exhaust vents, shall meet the minimum setbacks of the district. See Public Dedication Setback restrictions of this development code shall not apply to existing structures where the setback is reduced by a public dedication. D. Special Right of Way the placement of buildings and the establishment of yards shall conform the right-of-way widths for existing and proposed street alignments shown on the Sweet Home Street Plan. E-Commercial and Industrial Setbacks In commercial or industrial districts where an interior yard is not required and a structure is not located at the property line, it shall be set back at least 3, 3, feet from the property line to accommodate access to the building. <laughs> F. Way Setback Provisions 1. All fishing streams and all year-round flowing streams shall have a minimum setback of 50 feet from the top of each bank. Additional setbacks may be required for riparian areas, wetlands, and floodplains. Building permit applications and land use applications to the city shall clearly indicate the boundary limits for riparian areas, wetlands, and floodplains. Alteration of these areas, other than for continuation of agricultural use, by grading or placement of structures or impervious surfaces is prohibited unless approved by the city in accordance with the procedures of this development code and state law. Two, all other intermittent drainage ways and water courses shall have a minimum setback that includes the vegetative fringe, top of bank or a minimum 15 feet from the center of the drainage way whichever is greater. 17.82.100 Non-conforming uses A continuation a non-conforming use may be continued although not in conformity with the regulations for the zone in which the use is located. B. Discontinuation. If a non-conforming use is discontinued for a period of more than one year, the use shall not be resumed unless the resumed use conforms with the requirements of the development code. C. Restoration. 
If a non-conforming use is damaged or destroyed by fire, other casualty, or natural disaster, such use may be restored or replaced provided physical restoration or replacement is lawfully commenced within one year of the damage or destruction. The city may administratively grant a one-time, one-year extension to this requirement. D. Alteration and change of use. Alterations or changes in a non-conforming use may be permitted to reasonably continue the use. Such alterations or changes are subject to the non-conforming use provisions in Chapter 17.108. Exemptions Non-conforming single-family homes may be modified or expanded in compliance with development requirements of the R2 zone without the need to comply with the requirements and procedures in Chapter 17.108. All right. Pick up a typo on 17.82.040. Line four, I think they mean to say B and not buy. Or maybe buy is okay. <clears throat> Interesting that non that non-conforming single-family homes get an exemption if they're in the R2 zone. But no other zone is mentioned. And yeah, the, the, we're changing the R2 to the R3 because um, previously our R1 was low density, and R2 was high density, and then R3 was me medium density. It doesn't make any sense, so we're changing it to R1 low, R2 medium, R3 high. And so I'm a little confused as to which zone this is referring to and what the justification is for um, for that. Should that be R3 zone? So we will check on that. Let's see. The uh, <laughs> the underground structures portion reminded me of an apartment I saw when I was in college. It was a basement apartment, and that's all that was there was the basement. It, it was it was as if the house had been removed from the basement and a flat roof put placed over the basement, and there was an apartment there. So you could walk down, but you could have a dance party on top of your house, basically, and it was pretty much ground level. It was a very, very odd house. I think it was probably the result of inability to continue the structure or something like that. But that certainly is the building code. It, it just shows you what can happen. Yeah, what can happen if your uh, if your code is a little looser. Um, wow. It had been. I'm sure it had been that way for you know many, many years. But so no windows. There were no, there were there were um, window wells, so it, it had it had windows in it. They just okay. were below ground. <laughs> wow, that's very <laughs> odd. But college students will live in anything, right? And, uh, right. <laughs> Especially if the price is right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> in my growing up years, it was very common that people would build the basement, mm -hmm. move in, and then when they had money later, years later, they would continue on with the house, but I, I knew a lot of people that lived in it. nothing mm. but the basement for several years. And, but they eventually built something over the top. Yeah, eventually they get yeah. the house. But Interesting. <clears throat> so on E, the exemptions, mm -hmm. so for is this like an example if there is a single family home in a commercial zone that's non-conforming, if they did any alterations or modifications, it would have to follow the R2 zone requirements, correct? So, alterations and changes, alterations or changes in a non-conforming use may be permitted 
to reasonably continue the use. That that's the section you're talking about. On E on the last page. Oh, on E exemptions. So non-conforming single-family homes may be modified. Like if there is a oh, single-family in a commercial that's, zone, you know that's probably what it's talking it about. Or addition, whatever, expand it. It would need to meet because there are no commercial residential requirements. Mm -hmm. So if they were to do that in a commercial zone, they would have to the R two development standards would apply. To yeah. That, correct. Yeah, that's probably what it's talking about. And, okay. and so I wonder if maybe that should should be changed to say non-conforming single family homes in, in a commercial other. zone or yeah. in, in a non-residential zone. Yes, I think so. That would be a lot clearer. Good catch. And then E on the top of the other page, across, straight across, mm -hmm. E, setbacks in a commercial industrial zone. Mm -hmm. Those need to be set back three feet to allow for access. So right now, it's the setbacks are zero, but uh, it's, we have the same one now. It's a three feet in. Okay. Not a zero so would line. the sidewalk have to go up then, or would there just be a gap in between the sidewalk in the so three this is recess it's building. an interior yard so it's yeah. not there's no sidewalk none it, oh. it's an interior yard so this would be the side setback or or a rear setback that, that doesn't abut the street um got it so there wouldn't be a sidewalk to worry about okay <laughs> so no zero lot line yeah, well, no, it's it, this it, where where it's not located at the property line. It has to be at least three feet. So, in other words, oh, you can have it right at the lot at the lot line, or you can have it three feet or more. You can't have it one foot. Some some small amount less than that. Right. Okay, that makes sense. That way, if you have you know two, if they were both one foot off the property line. That would just be what a pain. Can happen. How would you get through there? And yeah, sounds like a bad idea. Yeah, right. <laughs> either either you either you share a wall or you have at least enough space yes. to get by. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Any other questions on that section? Yep. All right, that brings Carry us on. to Article Four. <laughs> And I close this one down. <clears throat> and find the document that I just sent to myself. This meeting chat is muted. Oh, do I have to?
All right, now we're mostly in business. Oh, yeah, let me. Why does it have to be so complicated? No. 17.90 applications, general. 17.90.010 summary of application types. A general. With the exceptions noted below, all development permits and land use actions are processed under the administrative procedures provided for in this chapter. There are four types of actions, each with its own procedures. B. Building Permit Building permits are subject to provisions of the Uniform Building Code and are processed administratively. Therefore, these actions are not considered land use actions and subject to appeal. The procedures in this chapter only apply if an action is necessary to cite the use or vary a requirement of the development code. 17.90.020 Type of Actions A Type I Action A ministerial action reviewed by staff based on clear and objective standards. Conditions are limited to those that ensure compliance with development code requirements and implement these standards. Decisions are memorialized on the relevant permit form or other order and notice provided to applicant. Appeal is to the Planning Commission. B. Type 2 Action A ministerial action reviewed by staff based on clear and objective standards, but with limited discretion. Conditions are limited to those that ensure compliance with development code requirements and implement these standards. Notice of the decision is sent to the applicant, and adjacent property owners who submitted comments, after a decision is reached. Appeal is to the Planning Commission. C. Type 3 Action A Type 3 Action is a quasi-judicial review in which the Planning Commission applies a mix of objective and subjective standards that allow discretion. Public notice and a public hearing are provided. Appeal of a Type 3 decision is to the City Council. D. Type 4 Action a Type 4 action can be either quasi-judicial or legislative actions. The quasi-judicial process applies to map amendments for individual properties. Plan and zone amendments or text amendments that impact larger areas are legislative actions. These later amendments must be initiated by city staff, planning commission, or city council, although a private party may suggest such amendments. Both actions require hearings before both the Planning Commission and City Council with the Commission providing an advisory role and the Council rendering the final decision. Public notice is provided for both and public hearings. Appeal of the decision is to the Land Use Board of Appeals, LUBA. 17.90.030 Table of Land Use Application Procedures Land Use Action Type Staff Planning Commission City Council Property Line Adjustment Type I Final Decision Unless Appealed Appeal, Staff Decision Appeal, Commission Decision Home Occupation Type I Final Decision Unless Appealed Appeal, Staff Decision Appeal, Commission Decision Interpretations Type I Final decision unless appealed Appeal, staff decision Appeal, commission decision Partition Type II Final decision unless appealed Appeal, staff decision Appeal, commission decision Adjustment Type II Final decision unless appealed. Appeal, staff decision. Appeal, commission decision. Site development. Review. Type 3. Recommendation. To commission. Final decision unless appealed. Appeal, commission decision. Conditional use. Type 3. Recommendation. To commission. 
Final decision unless appealed. Appeal, commission decision. Variance. Type, 3. Recommendation. To commission. Final decision unless appealed. Appeal, commission decision. Non-conforming. Uses. Type, 3. Recommendation. To commission. Final decision unless appealed. Appeal, commission decision. Subdivision and. Planned development. Type, 3. Recommendation. To commission. Final decision unless appealed. Appeal, commission decision. Comp plan map amendment. Type, 4. Recommendation. To commission. Recommendation. To council. Final decision unless appealed. Zone map amendment. Type, 4. Recommendation. To commission. Recommendation. To council. Final decision unless appealed. Text amendment. Type, 4. Recommendation. To commission. Recommendation. To council. Final decision unless appealed. Annexation. Type, 4. Recommendation. To commission. Recommendation. To council. Final decision unless appealed. 17.90.040 Other reviews. The city shall process the following activities administratively. These are non-discretionary actions by city staff whose decision is final and not subject to appeal. Building permits. Sign permits. Fence permits. <clears throat> temporary use. 17.90.050 Expiration of approval and time extension. Time limit. Unless otherwise specifically stated, type I and type II approvals shall be effective for two years following final approval. The applicant or developer shall exercise the approved decision within this time period. Type 3 time limits shall be dependent upon the type of application and applicable conditions. Type 4 approvals shall have no time limits. If the approval period is allowed to lapse, the applicant must resubmit the proposal, including all applicable fees. The applicant will be subject to all applicable standards currently in effect. B Time Extension Extensions may be granted in accordance with the original procedure for the application. Requests for extension of approval time shall be submitted, in writing, 30 days prior to the expiration date of the approval period. Decision For a time extension request, the only matter to be considered is the extension. Approval shall be based on a determination that the approved application cannot proceed due to circumstances beyond the applicant's control. Conditions of approval. During the review of an extension request, the conditions of approval may be revised to reflect development code changes and slash or changes in site or area conditions. E number of extensions. No more than two extensions shall be granted. Any further action shall require the submittal of a new application and fee. F time extension provisions for subdivisions and PDS. The Planning Commission may extend the approval period for any subdivision or PD for not more than two additional years. The Planning Commission may grant the request for extension if the circumstances are the same and the findings of fact are still appropriate. The Planning Commission may modify the original conditions of approval as part of any time extension review. 17.90.060 Exercising a Land Use Approval Unless otherwise specifically stated, Exercising a land use decision shall be subject to the following regulations. A building permit. Except for manufactured home parks, when a building permit is required as part of an approved land use, the decision shall be considered exercised with the first placement or permanent construction of a structure on a site. This may include the pouring of slabs or footings, any work beyond the stage of excavation, <clears throat> including the first permanent framing or assembly of the structure or any part thereof on its piling or foundation. Permanent construction does not include land preparation, such as clearing, grading, and filling, 
the installation of driveways or walkways, the excavation for a basement, footings, piers, or foundations or the erection of temporary forms, the construction of accessory buildings, such as garages or sheds not occupied as dwelling units or not used as part of the main <coughs> structure. B. Manufactured Homes Parks the decision shall be considered exercised with the beginning of construction of facilities for servicing the site on which the manufactured homes are to be placed. This shall include, at a minimum, the construction of streets with final site grading, or, the pouring of concrete pads, or, the <laughs> extension or installation of utilities. See specific use. If the approval does not require a building permit, the decision shall be considered exercised if the use or activity which was approved is in operation within the allotted time limit. 17.90.070 Modification of Decisions Except as noted in B, below, modifications to a final approved land use application shall be processed as a new application. However, the review of the modified request shall be limited to the proposed modification, S, with a determination on whether the change or changes comply with the decision criteria. Further, the modified request shall be considered a new application, with new notice, final decision date and rights of appeal. Conditions of approval may be revised to address the modified findings. B. Modification of a final approved plan or existing development by the Planning Commission may be processed as a Type 2 decision by the City Planner only if the following threshold criteria can be met. 1. There will be no change in land use. 2. The proposed change does not result in an increase in the overall impacts to adjacent properties. 3. There is no increase in the amount of operational activity. 4. The proposed change does not violate the standards of the land use zone. 5. The proposed change does not result in a change to lot or parcel boundary lines. All right. Any questions on that section? So is there any part of this that you want to change in regard to how you conduct your business? Um, I think that this... Uh, this uh, dividing it into types of actions is, I find it more convenient as a staff member to to have it categorized that way, and it's easier to explain to to people what what the requirement, what the threshold for for approval is. So I I think this is a, I mean I I appreciate it. Is 30 days long enough for you guys to process an extension for a public hearing review? Um, it's it's long enough to process it. It's not long enough to actually get to the public hearing uh, because that that depends on you know when they submitted the application and so forth. So 30 days but, prior to the expiration date of the so uh, now period. I think I mean. Yeah, if um, I think that's a reasonable amount of time to give, as long as as that's taken into account when uh, you know, for example, if they give if they give thirty days, if they apply for that extension within thirty days of of when their expiration would happen, but the um, the actual public hearing doesn't happen until after forty five days, okay. they shouldn't be rejected just because sure. they got to that point. Okay. Any other questions or concerns or thoughts on this section? That brings us up to the first type one property line adjustments. 17.92 property line adjustments. 17.92.010 applicability. A property line adjustment is a change to a property boundary that only extinguishes property lines or modifies existing lots or parcels and does not create a new parcel of land. This may include the elimination of property boundaries to consolidate lots or parcels. 17.92.020 Process 
a property line adjustment application shall be reviewed in accordance with the type I review procedures specified in Chapter 17.122. 17.92.030 Application An application for a property line adjustment shall be filed with the city and accompanied by the appropriate fee. It shall be the applicant's responsibility to submit a complete application which addresses the review criteria of this chapter. Notice shall be subject to the provisions in Chapter 17.x. 17.92.040 Submittal Requirements the following information and material must be submitted by the applicant. A. The application must be signed by the owners of all lots affected by the application. B. In addition, the following information shall be submitted by the applicant. 1. Copies of the officially recorded title transfer instrument, deed, warranty deed, or contract, that shows the legal description for the affected parcels. 2. Plan, map, or other document showing the properties before and after the adjustment. 3. A written statement which explains the applicant's reasons for adjusting the boundaries and demonstrating that the adjustment conforms to city land use regulations of the applicable zone. 17.92.050 Decision Criteria Approval of a property boundary adjustment shall require compliance with the following criteria. A. A property boundary adjustment cannot create or vacate a parcel. Creation or vacation of a parcel requires approval of a land division. B. Following the adjustment, all lots or parcels must comply with the area and dimension standards of the applicable zone. For existing non-conforming lots or parcels, the adjustment shall not increase the degree of non-conformance of the subject property or surrounding properties. See if there are existing structures on the lots or parcels, the boundary adjustment shall not reduce required setbacks or place a boundary beneath the structure. 17.92.060 Implementation After a lot line adjustment is approved, the new boundary becomes effective only after the following steps are completed. A. A legal description of the adjusted lots is recorded with Lynn County Clerk. B. If required by ORS Chapter 92 or the county surveyor, a final map and boundary survey are prepared and all new boundaries are monumented as required by ORS Chapters 92 and 209. The final map is submitted to the city for signatures and approval as outlined in Chapter 17.98. All right. So I just have a couple notes. They are kind of inconsistent. There's property boundary adjustments and it should be property line adjustments. And then there's one that says after a lot line adjustment, so it should say property line adjustment. So there's just some inconsistencies that I noticed. So if it's going to be called property line adjustment, it should be property line adjustment uh -huh. throughout. Yeah, so I just I changed agree. a couple places I saw that. And then under implementation, it says lot line adjustment should say property line adjustment. Under uh -huh. application, chapter 17.x. Yeah, I saw that. I, I think that it just must 17. not be. 17.122, type 1 application review yeah. procedure. Yeah. I did circle that. Yeah, we'll, we'll make sure that gets the right reference. Um, and one that I was concerned of, and may, maybe it's just making sure that I understand the right terminology. Uh, it says, A, a property line adjustment cannot create or vacate a parcel. Creation or vacation of a parcel requires approval of a land division. So the term vacate a parcel, I guess, is what I'm a little bit confused on. When you currently, when we have a property line adjustment, you can have one property absorbed into another by erasing that property line. A, a consolidation. You're combining lots, so you're not vacating them. So right. I think maybe that's the, the right. difference there. Okay. So vacating a parcel would be basically a lot consolidation, moving the boundary, but not having any other property take on that. Um, yeah, that it is a little, it is a little confusing though, because technically you're getting rid of one of the parcels and absorbing it into the other one. I, yeah, yeah. yeah, which maybe it maybe it's along the same lines of thinking of uh, vacating a public right of way. It it just doesn't it's just not there anymore. Um, Absorbing a parcel is not the same thing as vacating. Because we do consolidate a uh -huh. lot. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, half that of what would I be do a, is... a consolidation. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it is a little Which confusing. is different than a property line adjustment. Right. Well, no, we, no, actually, we, we do a consolidation. It it's way. under a property line adjustment. So what you do is you have two properties mm -hmm. and you want to combine them into one. So all you're doing literally is just moving the line and you're you're consolidating two lots into one and you're eliminating one lot. Okay. So I do that on a regular basis. Yeah. But vacating makes it sound, I don't know. It's, yeah. a, little, it's a little confusing. We might think about a different word there just to make sure it's clear. I mean, creating a lot would be a partition, so which is so I understand that one. Uh huh. Hmm. Okay. Any uh, any questions or concerns on this section? Nope. All right. Bring on. Seventeen point nine four home occupation. 17.94.010 applicability. The purpose of this section is to provide a means to allow residents to create and operate a business within their residence without creating significant impacts on adjacent properties. 17.94.020 process. A no employees. A home occupation where there are no employees other than family members residing in the residence or no more than one vehicle associated with the home occupation shall be reviewed in accordance with the type I review procedures specified in Chapter 17.122. B with employees. Home occupations proposed to have employees in addition to family members residing in the residence or more than one vehicle associated with the home occupation shall be reviewed as a conditional use in accordance with the Type 3 review procedures specified in Chapter 17.104. 17.94.030 Application any application for a home occupation use shall be filed with the city and accompanied by the appropriate fee. It shall be the applicant's responsibility to submit a complete application which addresses the review criteria of this section. 17.94.030 Submittal Requirements The application shall include a statement explaining the proposal and providing analysis of the proposal relative to the approval criteria. If appropriate, a preliminary plan should show pertinent information to scale to facilitate the review of the proposed development. 17.92.050 Decision Criteria No employees. The proposed home occupation must comply with the requirements in Chapter 17.64. With employees. In addition to requirements in, in Chapter 17.64, the proposed home occupation must comply with the conditional use criteria. 17.96 Interpretations 17.96.010. Sorry, I went too far. Okay. So, submittal requirement should be 17940040 because there's two 030s. Mm -hmm. um, the main difference here between what we do now uh, is that right now all home occupations are a, go to the Planning Commission. Mm -hmm. This just adds the uh, provision that if there's no employees, they just staff decides it and doesn't have to go to the planning commission. So, because um, we've talked before about some of the home occupations that just have so little impact that it's a shame to make them go through all the trouble to come to the planning commission. So, is that acceptable to you? Would you yes. rather a different standard? So, one thing we'll have to look into is right now there's a fee. It's a $600 fee because it does get noticed and goes to the Planning Commission. So, we may have to look at our fee schedule um, depending on which way it goes and have a reduced fee for ones that are just type 1 compared to ones okay. that are type 3. On that note, what I've seen in other cities is um, instead of having the fee based on the type of action that it is, the fee is based on whether it's a type one or a type two or a type three or a type four. And so your fee says type one action this much, type two action this much. Okay. And then it the, the, that gives some flexibility there. It also just point, points more toward the, the degree of um, effort required for the decision rather than just some arbitrary, this is what we think for this mm -hmm. particular action. That makes a lot of sense compared to what we already have. Mm -hmm.
also 17.64 is manufactured dwelling parks. Mm. Yeah, so. <clears throat> Seventeen point six eight is home occupation. Is it six eight? Yep. You know, we're probably when we go back and review. Um, this is going to be annoying for staff, but we're probably going to have to go through and check every single reference just uh -huh. to make sure. Those got past me, and that would be annoying. Okay, shall we move on? Zero applicability. The purpose of this section is to provide a means to resolve potentially conflicting requirements and unclear development code requirements, and identify uses not specifically listed in a particular zoning district, similar uses, but which are similar in character, scale, and performance to the permitted uses specified therein. 17.96.020 process. Interpretation requests shall be reviewed in accordance with the type I review procedures in Chapter 17.122. 17.96.030 application. Any application for an interpretation used shall be filed with the city and accompanied by the appropriate fee. It shall be the applicant's responsibility to submit a complete application which addresses the review criteria of this section. Notice shall be subject to the provisions in Chapter 17.122. 17.96.040 Decision Criteria The city manager or designee is authorized to make such an appropriate interpretation of the development code provided that the applicant demonstrates that the proposed use satisfies the following criteria. A. The interpretation is consistent with the purpose of the development code and any appropriate purpose statement in an underlying zoning district or development requirement. B. The resulting interpretation conforms to the applicable standards and limitations of the underlying zoning district. In approving an application for a similar use, the city may determine whether the use is prohibited or classified as permitted, special use or conditionally permitted in a specified zone. So this is a, a, a thing that we actually don't really have right now, um, but other larger cities have. Essentially, you can apply to have an interpretation done. Um, so it's kind of new to me. Uh, never really had to deal with it before, but I can see the use. I just, for some interpretations, I'd rather just talk to the applicant <laughs> and tell them what we think rather than go through a big uh, application process. However, um, you know, I can see instances where they would want the paper trail of a staff report and yeah. and all that kind of outlining what uh, the reasons for the interpretation and so forth so that they have some basis to contest it or appeal it or something like that. So what I I guess in but action, <laughs> what's that? I was going to say, you're going to have a paper trail anyway, right? True, but I guess one one thing that this does is is it's hard to appeal something when you just have somebody's word on it. So, um, you know, if we have a pre-app meeting and somebody wants to put in a, a use that we're not really sure about, and we say, yeah, I don't, I, I don't think that's really going to work in this zone, we're not going to uh, approve that as a permitted use. Um, how do how do you appeal that right if you're the applicant how do you appeal that to the planning commission you got to have something documented so this kind of i guess forces a process so i guess the the only way i see this actually being used is if someone doesn't like the verbal answer they're getting from staff and says in that case you better document this and so that i can appeal it to the planning commission and and that interpretation would be something that's appealable really well we have an example right now that actually i actually had the it's a um, surveyor he interprets something a little bit different than what joe and i did so i asked him to email me his interpretation so i have it for record and then that way joe and i can send him an email back 
So we actually kind of do this just on our own. It depends on the situation mm -hmm. because this is a um, type two decision, so it doesn't have to go in front of planning commission. However, if there's ever any question as to how we got to that decision, I wanted documentation for it. So it's yeah. It, this yeah. this makes it more formal. Yeah. Then what we know, sometimes we just have a conversation on the phone and sometimes it's when we're the three of us, you know, are not in agreement on how that should go. Then I say, hey, please send me an email with this. And yeah. then we have an email conversation instead. So I, I don't think it's going to be much more complicated than that. Right. And, and I and I think we we'd want to be careful with the, the fee for something like this, because that the perception of an applicant needing to pay just to find out what the requirement is, is, is kind of frustrating. So, um, well, the, part of this, the, the part of this that I don't like is the, uh, the language that says to resolve potentially conflicting requirements and unclear development code requirements. Mm -hmm. Well, our whole goal here is to make things very clear Mm -hmm. And by, by putting unclear development code requirements in a document like this, mm -hmm. I think already makes it look like, oh boy, you better watch out because there's stuff in here that's not clear. And that puts you in a really difficult position. I, I get, I, I understand the concern, but my... I, I'm not as worried about that mainly because this is intended to be a living document and we're trying to, to set the foundation for future changes. And it, it could very well be possible that in the future changes are made that are not done as clearly as we would like them to be and appear to conflict with other parts of the code. And having that documentation also sets that precedent. Mm hmm That you can look back on and say, what did we do? Go back right. and look. This is what we did. We need code for that now. So well, especially if we put it in the code. Right. Especially so, you know, I could see in the far future if we're saying, okay, we're doing a code review, let's look at the let's look at the file of interpretations that we've mm -hmm. done over the years yeah. and see what hasn't been clear, what do we really need to do to to make sure it works better. And it does create that record. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, I I understand. I think that it's yeah, it's not it's not great to suggest that we're going to be unclear but it's kind of reflecting reality i suppose we're human right we may have missed something in here well it's just a, it's it, like the example today we've had the same thing there's a it's a frontage requirement based on or and or the flagpole easement frontage anyway when you put it all together they they conflict with each other and so everyone always interprets it different. And so it's not the first time that we've had the same issue. So it's one of the confusing things. So if we, if we document it and we have it, you know, marked out, then it, and there are, I mean, it's changed a little bit in here, which is great that we, we are addressing it in some of these sections, but um, there's going to be ones where someone's going to interpret, even if we think these are clear, someone might not think they're as clear as we do. So I think it just gives us that extra. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. oh, okay, okay. Any other or uh, any other thoughts or things you, you'd like us to look at changing? And Commissioner Journey, I didn't I didn't want to shut down your concern. If if that's something that we should clarify or or work on, we we certainly are happy to do that. No, I mean, I. it's good to hear your opinion. I just, if I was in your position, I would not want a document uh -huh. that says, <laughs> uh -huh. that my, you know, that what, what I'm going by has unclear requirements. Right, right. right. Here, here's a file folder full of all the mistakes I've made, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. And I know that the Planning Commission staff has mm -hmm. memorialized everything, and there is a list of, um, or there's a record of, interpretations that you can go back and look at for precedent. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I know that already exists. I, th I think also it kind of puts staff on notice that, hey, you can't just hand out decisions willy nilly. You got to actually do your homework and make sure they're documented. Um, but it also prepares for that inevitable staff turnover that we will have at some point. 
Um, so, yeah, no, I, I, I. What are you saying? No, I'm not. I'm not making I'm any not predictions uh, about <laughs> staff that's in the room. I'm just saying things happen, uh, and we try to be. <laughs> We're, we're going through a, uh, within our department for a while, we've been working on documenting our processes mm -hmm. um, with an eye for both turnover, but also cross training and helping other people uh, in other departments of the city understand how we work in our department. And so it kind of got things on our minds of, of trying to explain these things to other people and making sure that, mm -hmm. you know, we can leave the city in better shape for our replacements regardless of how that actually happens. So, but yeah, there's no no uh, no displeasure with any current staff that I'm aware of. Yes. I have to take each one of these processes and break it down and tell people how to oh, do it. Yeah. That's what we're working on right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, All thank right. you for the re thank you for the reassurance. Oh, sure. sure. <laughs> All right, moving on. 17.98 partitions. 17.98.010 applicability. A partition is required for any land division which creates two or three parcels in a calendar year. 17.98.020 process. Preliminary plats for partitions shall be reviewed in accordance with the Type 2 review procedures in Chapter 17.124. 17.98.030 application. An application for a partition shall be filed with the city and accompanied by the appropriate fee. Notice shall be subject to the provisions in Chapter 17.124. 17.98.040 submittal requirements. A. The applicant shall prepare and submit a preliminary plan and other supplemental information as may be required by city staff to indicate the intent of the development. The application shall include a statement explaining the proposal and providing analysis of the proposal relative to the approval criteria. The applicant shall submit 111x17 copy of the preliminary plan along with one digital copy. The plan shall include the following information. 1. General information. The following general information shall be shown on the tentative plan. A vicinity map showing all streets, property lines, streams, and other pertinent data to locate the proposal. B. North arrow and scale of drawing. C. Tax map and tax lot number or tax account of the subject property. D. Dimensions and size in square feet or acres of the subject property and of all proposed parcels. Two existing conditions. A. Location of all existing easements within the property. B. Location of city utilities, water, sanitary sewer, storm drainage, within or adjacent to the property proposed for use to serve the development. C. The location and direction of water courses or drainage swales on the subject property. D. Existing use of the property, including location of existing structures with dimensions of the structures and distances from property lines. It shall be noted whether the existing structures are to remain or be removed from the property. 3. Proposed plan. A. Locations, approximate dimensions, and area in square feet of all proposed parcels. All parcels shall be numbered consecutively. B. Location, width, and purpose of any proposed easements. B. At the discretion of the city, Specific requirements may be waived provided there is sufficient information to allow processing of an application. 17.98.050 Decision Criteria Approval of a partition shall be subject to the following decision criteria. A. Each parcel shall satisfy the dimensional standards of the applicable zone, unless a variance from these standards is approved. B. The parcels shall meet the development standards for land division of Chapter 17.58. C. Existing dwellings and accessory structures shall comply with the setback requirements of the applicable zone, including accessory structures which have a setback established by the building size, unless a variance from the requirements is approved. D. Adequate public facilities, including access, shall be available to serve the existing and newly created parcels. If adjacent properties are undeveloped, not developed to their maximum density, or landlocked, 
consideration will be given to extending appropriate access to those properties in accordance with provisions in Chapters 17.42 and 17.44. 17.98.060 Final Plat Approval A Survey Within two years of the final decision unless appealed approving a preliminary plat, a final survey of the approved plat shall be recorded. Failure to record a plat within the required time period shall void the approval and require a new partitioning application. B. Final approval. The city manager shall sign the final plat if the plat substantially conforms to the approved preliminary plat, and if the conditions of approval are satisfied. C. Final plat. The final plat shall conform to the requirements in ORS Chapter 92 and applicable county surveying requirements. D. Recording of approved plat. The final plat shall be recorded with Lynn County and a copy of the recorded document shall be submitted to the city. The applicant shall be responsible for all recording fees. E. Sale and development. No parcel shall be sold, transferred, or assigned until the final approved plat is recorded and evidence of the recording is submitted to the city. Building permits shall not be issued prior to recording of the final plat if the proposed structure will violate this code absent recording the partition. F. Validity. Partition approval is valid in perpetuity upon recording of the final surveyed plat. 17.98.070 Expedited Land Division. When an expedited land division for residential use only is requested by an applicant the city shall use the procedures for expedited land divisions specified under ORS 197.365 in lieu of the procedures described in Chapter 17.96, if the application complies with the conditions and standards of ORS 197.360 through 197.380. So one difference in here, um, right now under 17.98.060 final plat A survey, right now we have within one year is our current oh. standard. This okay. says within two. So I guess I'm asking your thoughts on whether it should stay one or if two, if you want to move it to two years for final decision. Right now we have it within one year of the final decision. It has to be platted and recorded. A final plat has to be given to staff for review. What do we get for expirations for these reviews, type three reviews? So they have decisions. one year from the date of decision. But here we're changing that to two years. Well, here, yeah, it one. says two years. So it's 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 up to you guys whether we keep it one year the way it is now or we change it to but two But they years. could apply after one year for an additional year. Have there yes, been any problems can. with one year? No, we've, I've had to go and let people know, hey, your one year's up and they'll file an extension. Um, we've had a couple file extensions and it's not that big of a deal. So. Well, then I don't see, I don't see any reason to change it then if it's working for the most part. The only, I, either. I think the only reason I would suggest going with this two year model is that depending on the property, getting any action with DSL uh -huh. on yeah, wetlands. Yeah. Yes can take a significant amount of time and make it really hard for people to get within that one year mark. So, and those are the ones that have required extensions. Right, all the extensions have been due to DSL issues. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure that two years really causes us much trouble. I mean, is there a downside to giving people an extra year, Angela, that you know of? No. Um, they just can't do any development until they get that done. So it's kind of on them to get it done. And if they want to, like we have one right now, a gentleman's doing a partition. He put in the building permits, but his partition's not complete. And so he's got to wait. It's now on hold until he finishes and it's recorded. So it's more on there, on them, than it is on us. So I don't see any. Okay. So for staff, there's not really a downside. Years? What's that? So yes, you guys staff, are good for, for staff. Years? It's not a big deal. Okay. So do we need to go back to those um, chapters on expiration on certain review? No, because it's decisions? just it's still 30 days from the, the time that it's due. So if it's say, we made a decision today, two years from today is when it would be due. So they have 30 days from, you know, before that ending in order to extend it. So I don't think that needs to be changed. Okay. If it ain't, don't. 
If it ain't broke, don't fix it. I don't really care whatever you guys. I just brought it up because yeah. just so you know, there's a difference between okay. what yeah. we have now and what it, what is saying in here. You know, I think while it may not be broken for some people, it is broken for some. Mm -hmm. uh, for, <laughs> so I guess that's the question is, who, who do you want it to be fixed for? Um, well, really, I, I defer to your decision because it affects your workload or something like that. So it's. As staff, I, I, I don't think we see a downside to having it at two years as specified here in the in the draft. Um, and so I, I think we're comfortable with that. If that's, that's fine with me. My, fine with me too, then. Our goal not to be more difficult than we mm -hmm. have to be. I appreciate that. Yeah. One thing I, this, I would vote for two years. The, that same uh, provision. It says within two years of the final decision unless appealed approving a preliminary plat. Does that phrasing confuse anyone else, or is it just me? It does, but I know what it means. I mean, I, I, I get what they're trying to say, but it seems like it should be worded slightly different, or a comma should be in there. I think it should be a comma, unless appealed. No, wait, within two years of the final decision, unless appealed. It so you're right. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we need to either put some parentheses in there or, or fix that somehow, so we'll... We'll come up yeah, with because, something that makes because sense. Because if it's appealed, then it has a different decision right. date. So, but dealing with other agencies of the government, contractors, the whole works. Yeah. A year could get by awfully quickly. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it has. There's been a yeah. few that I've had to say, "Hey, by the way," and they've had to reapply because they've missed their date. So. Yeah. We'll also have to do some homework on this final section where it says expedited land division. Because the that. procedures described in 17.96, there there aren't any. That's the interpretations uh, section that we just read. So that's that's an error, and I'll have to take a look at this ORS and see what what this actually does. Because I I haven't heard of an expedited land division before. Okay, if we haven't observed. <clears throat> Uh, Jamie has folded her book up. I've got an 8.30 <laughs> appointment. Yes, uh, we are out of time. I apologize. I know. Let's, let's call it for the night. All righty. Long, long day for me. We'll close this meeting at 8.27. Thank you. You have to hurry to get to your appointment. I know it. Thank you very much. Thank oh, you, everybody. Bye-bye. FYI, uh, the next council meeting, uh, the council will vote on a, rip, on a uh, new member of the planning commission. So... Um, to replace to praise uh, Greg, um, Greg Corn. So yes, I thought. Oh, you must oh, have you missed were, the meeting I, where oh, that was brought up. Here. Yes. Um, essentially, his his. Uh, I guess he's going through a, a, pro, a school program of some kind. Okay. And okay. he's just not able to. Okay. His schedule is too up in the air and yep. all over the okay. place. So. Yeah. Gosh. So yes. So we uh, maybe by the time we have another meeting, we'll have a replacement. Planning okay. Commissioner. Oh, that's Thank you. Too bad. I like him. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Bye bye. See ya. Good night. Good night.